The missionary's wife's head projected itself over the garden wall and broke into a beam of welcome. Rusty hurriedly returned the smile. Where have you been, dear? asked his garrulous neighbor. I was expecting you for lunch. You've never been away so long. I've finished all my work now, you know. Was it a nice walk? I know you're thirsty. Come in and have a nice cool lemonade. There's nothing like iced lemonade to refresh one after a long walk. I remember when I was a girl, having to walk down to Dehra from Missouri, I filled my thermos with lemonade. But Rusty had gone. He did not wish to hurt the missionary's wife's feelings by refusing the lemonade, but after experiencing the chart shop, the very idea of a lemonade offended him. But he decided that this Sunday he would contribute an extra four annas to the missionary's fund for upkeep of church, wife, and garden, and with this good thought in mind, went to his room. Rusty threw himself on his bed, and now his imagination began building dreams on a newfound reality, for he had agreed to meet Somi again. And so, the next day, his steps took him to the chart shop in the bazaar, past the clock tower, past the smart shops, down the road, far from the guardian's house. The fleshy god of the tiki smiled at Rusty in a manner that seemed to signify that the boy was now likely to become a regular customer. The banana plate was ready, the tikis in it flavored with spiced sauces. Hello, best favorite friend, said Somi, appearing out of the surrounding vapor, his slippers loose, chup chup chup, loose, open slippers that hung onto the toes by a strap and slapped against the heels as he walked. I'm glad you come again. After tikis, you must have something else, chat or golgappas, all right? Somi removed his slippers and joined Rusty, who had somehow managed to sit cross-legged on the ground in a proper fashion. Somi said, Tell me something about yourself. By what misfortune are you an Englishman? How is it that you have been here all your life and never been to a chart shop before? Well, my guardian is very strict, said Rusty. He wanted to bring me up in English ways, and he has succeeded. Till now, said Somi, and laughed, the laugh rippling up in his throat, breaking out and forcing its way through the smoke. Then a large figure loomed in front of the boys, and Rusty recognized him as Ranbir, the youth he had met on the bicycle. Another best favorite friend, said Somi. Ranbir did not smile, but opened his mouth a little, gaped at Rusty, and nodded his head. When he nodded, hair fell untidily across his forehead, thick black bushy hair, wild and uncontrollable. He wore a long white cotton tunic hanging out over his baggy pajamas. His feet were bare and dirty, big feet strong. Hello, mister said Ranbir in a gruff voice that disguised his shyness. He said no more for a while, but joined them in their meal. They ate, chaat, a spicy salad of potato, guava, and orange, and then golgappas, baked flour cups filled with burning syrups. Rusty felt at ease and began to talk telling his companions about his school in the hills, the house of his guardian, Mr. Harrison himself, and the supple Malacca game. The story was listened to with some amusement. Apparently Rusty's life had been very dull to date, and Somi and Ranbir pitied him for it. Tomorrow is holy, said Ranbir. You must play with me, then you will be my friend. What is holy? asked Rusty. Ranbir looked at him in amazement. You do not know about Holi? It is a Hindu festival of color. It is the day on which we celebrate the coming of spring, when we throw color on each other and shout and sing and forget our misery, for the colors mean the rebirth of spring and a new life in our hearts. 
You do not know of it? Rusty was somewhat bewildered by Ranbir's sudden eloquence and began to have doubts about this game. It seemed to him a primitive sort of pastime, this throwing of paint about the place. I might get into trouble, he said. I'm not supposed to come here anyway, and my guardian might return any day. Don't tell him about it, said Ranbir. Oh, he has ways of finding out. I'll get a thrashing. Huh said Ranbir, in a disappointed and somewhat disgusted expression on his mobile face. You are afraid to spoil your clothes, mister. That is it. You are just a snob. Somi laughed. That's what I told him yesterday, and only then did he join me in the chat shop. I think we should call him a snob whenever he makes excuses. Rusty was enjoying the chat. He ate Golgappa after Golgappa until his throat was almost aflame and his stomach burning itself out. He was not very concerned about Holi. He was content with the present, content to enjoy the newfound pleasures of the chat shop and say, Well, I'll see. If my guardian doesn't come back tomorrow, I'll play Holi with you. All right? Ranbir was pleased, he said. I will be waiting in the jungle behind your house. When you hear the drum beat in the jungle, then it is me. Then come. Will you be there too, Somi? Asked Rusty. Somehow he felt safe in Somi's presence. I do not play holy, said Somi. You see, I am different to Ranbir. I wear a turban and he does not. Also, there is a bangle on my wrist, which means that I am a Sikh. We don't play it. But I will see you the day after, here in the chat shop. Somi left the shop and was swallowed up by smoke and steam. But the chup-chup of his loose slippers could be heard for some time, until their sound was lost in the greater sound of the bazaar outside. In the bazaar, people haggled over counters. Children played in the spring sunshine, dogs courted one another, and Ranbir and Rusty continued eating Golgappas. The afternoon was warm and lazy, unusually so for spring, very quiet, as though resting in the interval between the spring and the coming summer. There was no sign of the missionary's wife or the sweeper boy when Rusty returned. But Mr. Harrison's car stood in the driveway of the house. At sight of the car, Rusty felt a little weak and frightened. He had not expected his guardian to return so soon and had, in fact, almost forgotten his existence. But now he forgot all about the chat shop in Somi and Ranbir and ran up the veranda steps in a panic. Mr. Harrison was at the top of the veranda steps, standing behind the potted palms. The boy said, Oh, hello sir, you're back. He knew of nothing else to say but tried to make his little piece sound enthusiastic. Where have you been all day? asked Mr. Harrison, without looking once at the startled boy. Our neighbors haven't seen much of you lately. I've been for a walk, sir. You have been to the bazaar. The boy hesitated before making a denial. The man's eyes were on him now, and to lie, Rusty would have had to lower his eyes, and this he could not do. Yes, sir, I went to the bazaar. May I ask why? Because I had nothing to do. If you had nothing to do, you could have visited our neighbors. The bazaar is not the place for you, you know that. But nothing happened to me. That's not the point, said Mr. Harrison, and now his normally dry voice took on a faint shrill note of excitement, and he spoke rapidly. The point is, I have told you never to visit the bazaar. You belong here, to this house, this road, these people. Don't go where you don't belong. Rusty wanted to argue, longed to rebel, but fear of Mr. Harrison held him back. He wanted to resist the man's authority, but he was conscious of the supple malacca cane in the glass cupboard. I'm sorry, sir. But his cowardice did him no good. The guardian went over to the glass cupboard, brought out the cane, flexed it in his hands. He said, It is not enough to say you're sorry. You must be made to feel sorry. Bend over the sofa. 
The boy bent over the sofa, clenched his teeth, and dug his fingers into the cushions. The cane swished through the air, landing on his bottom with a slap, knocking the dust from his pants. Rusty felt no pain, but his guardian waited, allowing the cut to sink in. Then he administered the second stroke, and this time it hurt. It stung into the boy's buttocks, burning up the flesh, conditioning it for the remaining cuts. At the sixth stroke of the supple malacca cane, which was usually the last, Rusty let out a wild whoop, leapt over the sofa and charged from the room. He lay groaning on his bed until the pain had eased. But the flesh was so sore that he could not touch the place where the cane had fallen. Wriggling out of his pants, he examined his backside in the mirror. Mr. Harrison had been most accurate. A thick purple welt stretched across both cheeks, and a little blood trickled down the boy's thigh. The blood had a cool, almost soothing effect, but the sight of it made Rusty feel faint. He lay down and moaned for pleasure. He pitied himself enough to want to cry but he knew the futility of tears. But the pain and the sense of injustice he felt were both real. A shadow fell across the bed. Someone was at the window, and Rusty looked up. The sweeper boy showed his teeth. What do you want? asked Rusty gruffly. You hurt, Chota Sahib? The sweeper boy's sympathies provoked only suspicion in Rusty. You told Mr. Harrison where I went, said Rusty, but the sweeper boy cocked his head to one side and asked innocently, Where you went, Chota Sahib? Oh, never mind, go away. But you hurt. Get out, shouted Rusty. The smile vanished, leaving only a sad, frightened look in the sweeper boy's eyes. Rusty hated hurting people's feelings, but he was not accustomed to familiarity with servants, and yet, only a few minutes ago, he had been beaten for visiting the bazaar, where there were so many like the sweeper boy. The sweeper boy turned from the window, leaving wet finger marks on the sill, then lifted his buckets from the ground, and with his knees bent to take the weight, walked away. His feet splashed a little in the water he had spilt, and the soft red mud flew up and flecked his legs. Angry with his guardian and with the servant, and most of all with himself, Rusty buried his head in his pillow and tried to shut out reality. He forced a dream in which he was thrashing Mr. Harrison until the guardian begged for mercy.